Hello friends, another episode. Yay! Today was so fun. I got to talk to Samantha Sun. Hashtag poetry. Um, Samantha and I worked together on a campaign a couple of months ago, and that's how we really got to know each other. And um, it's just been a blast to get to know her. And this recording that we just did with each other was really the first time that we've had like a pretty in-depth conversation with each other and um, it was really fun and it, it flowed really, really well. Um, Samantha is a uh, sex worker and stripper that is uh, lives in Canada but has spent time over in the UK and so she's gotten the chance to travel a bit so she has um, some really fun stories from uh, you know, being able to travel and live in different countries and have different experiences. Um, and Samantha is also an Asian sex worker and um, was able to talk on some of the uh, things that, you know, Asian sex workers are dealing with. And so I'm really grateful that we were able to go there a little bit and, and share that with some people because um, things have been very difficult, obviously, in the, the Asian community lately uh, with the racism and discrimination and just the atrocities that are taking place in that community specifically right now. Um, not to diminish the atrocities of any other community, but um, it was really nice to be able to highlight that and, um, and to hear uh, her voice speak on these things. Um, but we had a really, really good time. Um, went a little longer than normal, but um, you know, you're not even going to notice. The time is going to fly right by, just like it did when we were with each other and chatting. So, um, you know, I think that there's a lot to learn from this particular episode. Um, and Samantha and I also reflected on the things that we've learned in working together on our project. I don't know if you remember, but um, we did a stripper symposium about internet law. And so that's specifically where Samantha and I um, had a chance to intersect. So um, yeah, and if you'd like to know more about the Internet Law Stripper Symposium, feel free to send me a DM, um, either at the Queen of Sexy or at yes, a stripper podcast.com. So yeah, pay close attention. I hope you enjoy this one and that you're all doing well out there. Today, I've got Samantha Sun on the line with me. Hello, Queen. Hello. Hi. How are you? Hi. How are you today? Good. good it's very sunny here is it mm -hmm. it feels very strange because be, i'll be my i'm in my backyard i'll be sunbathing and i'll be like hmm it is march hmm something something climate change so yeah, i get exactly. this like <laughs> i get this immediate sense of like dread but coupled with the fact that i'm really happy to be it's basking so in the nice. sun yeah. yeah so just to give everyone some context you're in canada right now right Yes, I'm in yeah. Canada. Normally, it is still snowing by this time, so oh it's very gosh. strange to be like nearly 20 degrees and sunny. Well, okay, so 20 degrees, so a lot of Americans listen to this show, so you, right. you mean 20 degrees... Celsius. Celsius, correct. Yeah. What is that in Fahrenheit? I, have I don't no know. Idea. We're gonna have to like get a converter for that. <laughs> Hold on, yeah. I'm gonna do that right now. Okay, I'm gonna do find it right out. now. Yeah. <laughs> so while Samantha's looking that up, I just want to remind all of our viewers that we are now officially accepting donations to Yes a Stripper Podcast. This is because we want to keep this show as commercial free as possible. The donations are going to beautiful guests like Samantha Sun. A lot of strippers and sex workers are out of work right now. So this is kind of our way of giving back to the community and trying to compensate our guests. But we can only do that with the help of our listeners and potential sponsors. We'll only take on sponsors if you're an ethical brand. However, if you're not sure what that is, feel free to DM us on Instagram at Yes, a Stripper Podcast. And if you want to donate to our PayPal, you can find us at paypal.me forward slash Yes, a Stripper Podcast. Okay, enough of that. Did you find the answer? It's, yeah, it's 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, but that's like too warm yeah, in Canada right now. <laughs> I don't even think New York is this warm. So it's like, uh, <laughs> I get very like, again, it's like mixed feelings of like, I love worshiping the sun 
And then I'm right. like, wait, it's March. This is really wrong. Yeah, something's really off for sure. I saw an ad, like an article in the news the other day that was like, two million people are maybe affected by tornadoes like any minute now. And it's like, wow, that is a lot of people to be terrorized by tornadoes. Like, how many tornadoes are we talking? Like, what is going on? And, you know, yeah, climate change is fucking scary, dude. It's really real. And I mean, it seems like a weird thing to talk about on a stripper podcast, but like if we're talking about activism, one of the biggest like pillars is yeah. sustainability and yeah. we're doing a terrible job of that just globally. So Oh my gosh. Yeah. I feel like we could talk about problems forever. So, okay. So uh, we're, we're, okay. So here you go, guys. Samantha and I like know each other. We talk to each other pretty regularly. We've done some work together. Samantha, yeah. really quick for our audience, can you let everyone know what your pronouns are? Oh yeah, my pronouns are she/her. Perfect. I'm boring. No. You... <laughs> <laughs> Not boring. So Samantha and I are like really comfortable talking with each other, as you can kind of tell. And like, I'm just so excited to talk to you because like already I feel like we're talking about things that we care about and I feel like that's so representative of like strippers and sex workers in general that we like are always talking about ways to save the world and save humanity yeah very strange like I I don't know I can't speak for myself I don't know about you but I didn't go into this job thinking I was gonna become like do the job of the FBI. I really thought I just wanted to, I just wanted to show people my butt for money and yeah. I didn't sign up for any of this, but here I am. Um, yeah. And I like to think of myself as like, I mean, pretty intellectually stimulated by all the stuff me and you have sort of concurrently been doing together. And yeah, that's been somehow the most fulfilling part of all yeah. of this. Um. And so, yeah, I mean, I'm happy to be, I'm happy to be involved now at this capacity. I know not everybody else is. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's definitely a lot of work and we're doing it for free um, for the most part. And then we have to like kind of be creative and find ways of like, okay, how can we share this information and like get paid at the same time? And that we don't do it to get paid, but there's so much work that went into what we did mm -hmm. that it's like, but like we need to eat and pay Liter rent, yeah. you know? So this is kind of like the foundation of like, I suppose my flavor of activism. Cause I know people have different sort of varying capacities for things. Um, but like, I've always preferred potentially maybe not always speaking out exactly on like issues and more just providing people with like some kind of alternative source of income so yeah. that they can then not worry about putting food on the table and then they can then continue like the sort of passing the torch and yeah. doing some kind of advocacy. Yeah. Cause I guess if you like are constantly worried about whether or not you can pay your rent or pay your bills, you are really not the best activist. There's no way. How can you be? You yeah. have no capacity for anything else. Exactly. So. Well, that's when burnout kind of comes into yeah. play. So can you fill everybody in about what the work is that we just did a couple of months ago? Yeah. So um, I want to say around November, December, we were informed by a pole dancer in London that wrote a, a petition that Basically, Instagram was going to change their terms of conditions and especially surrounding what they consider solicitation and nudity, which would just result in more blanket censorship for people like us and more broadly speaking, artists, creatives, anybody who has anything to do with work that is erotic or just sensual. Yeah. Um, so yeah i don't know i kind of we just sort of roped each other in and i was like i mean i'm the like world's most like unemployed person and i am basically grifting off my parents right now because i can so i was like you know what i actually have the time yeah. to devote to this and so that kind of like devolved into hey we really need somebody to compile some notes on american cyber law and then i went I love reading legal jargon. <laughs> I'm such a nerd. Let me do it. And then three weeks later, I was like, guys, this is way bigger than I thought it was. Yeah. I yeah. had like a 20 page document and then us and a bunch of other um, really amazing strippers and sex workers and activists sort of 
sort of across the like the gram yeah. mostly in LA I want to say I don't recall too many other people well of... we were working with Nova Kane who's over in Florida and then we have Jordan right. and Onyx Black who were in LA and then we were working with Ava Hennessy over in the UK and right yes Bam was also in the group and she's I'm not exactly sure where, but not LA. And then Maggie's Toronto is in the thread and they're in Canada. So it was really like kind of- International. Yeah, it, it was pretty international. And then, you know, our researcher that we work with, which is Carolina, um, yes. AKA uh, blogger on poll uh, is in, in Europe. Yeah. She's in the UK, and, but she's Italian. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, pretty spread out. Anyway, we like, end up doing like a seminar on this because I just was like we have a lot of information this is three hours worth of work mm. um and I think it turned out pretty really like pretty well and I w what I get out of it more so than let's say any ticket sales or pay was that now I have a really really robust understanding mm -hmm. of U.S. cyber law yeah and then also prostitution law and you know, the level of criminalization and how that is directly related to some really, really intense and very dark issues surrounding like trafficking and sexual abuse and child sexual abuse mm -hmm. and how kind of all of these kind of circles create like a Venn diagram where mm -hmm. the overlap often is sex work. Mm -hmm. And it's weird because it also like at one hand, I, I think sex worker activism for a while has tried to really separate themselves from the narrative of victimhood but in doing so we've no longer like allowed ourselves to be able to identify as sometimes victims which is really dangerous because most of us have victimhood of some kind in terms of sexual harassment but that doesn't take away from our ability to be consenting adults about right. what we want to do with our body so it was like yeah. very intellectually stimulating i really enjoyed all the stuff that we do together and yeah. continue to do together i feel very sort of like spark like my brain is massaged by it <laughs> yeah yeah even though it was fucking exhausting it was yeah. exhausting and then what you know i feel like we learned a lot from it not just like about the law and how you know immigration and and sex work and child abuse are all intersectional but mm -hmm. also like how to treat each other in the process and like how yes. to even treat ourselves like for instance we did two seminars in one day and they were like two and a half hour long seminars and the second seminar i was like exhausted i was completely yeah. exhausted from all of the work we did leading up to it and then like all of the energy we put into the first one by the time it was the second one i was like oh my god i'm exhausted like it's it was hard. intense yeah it was intense and i'm you know what i i learned so much from that as well particularly yeah. with like again one of the interesting things about organizing around sex work is that because it's so kind of um ubiquitous all of us can't really be seen as a monolith so when we are put into a group together where we try to advocate together as a team right it's it presents this interesting challenge where like so many of us have varying levels of precariousness um and a lot of us still have itch like un undealt with issues surrounding like race and gender and queerness and when you mix that up it's sometimes really really great and sometimes it can be very very conflicting mm. but i'm really grateful for the conflicting stuff that we got and the feedback that we got because i know so much better now mm -hmm. and in the future as i organize with mm -hmm. um my crew in london with people in toronto and mm -hmm. with everyone you are with in la i'm assuming you're still in la no i'm not I'm not, You're not in LA. In LA. No, I'm. Are, I, I'm also uh, mooching off my parents. So got it. Are you? Wait, are you still working with Soldiers of Pole? Oh yes. Yeah, yes, of course. Of course. Yeah. So yeah. So I think of them as LA. <laughs> my yeah. brain like conceptualizes it. A lot LA. of um, Strippers United, formerly known as Soldiers of Pole, is in LA. A lot. Yeah. yeah. And so yeah, like I guess um, in the future, as I as I sort of like work with and around all these different organizations i will have like a much stronger and better approach yeah and it like all of this i would not have picked up had we not 
put ourselves through the trenches three months ago. <clears throat> definitely, definitely. I mean, I consider myself someone who like does the work daily and what I learned from that particular event was like, uh, I learned a lot about microaggressions um, yeah. as a, particularly me as a white woman and how that is perceived to, uh, for people of color. And, and then I learned so much about microaggressions from that, that there was a moment in another thing that I wasn't a part of, but I felt like what I had done was a microaggression and nobody called me out for it but i could not fucking sleep that night and i stayed up all night going why does that one dumb thing that i said why is that driving me nuts because it didn't sound like a mean thing but mm -hmm. it to me and it would just take too long for me to explain it but the point is it's, it took me like 12 hours to figure out on my own oh i was exhibiting microaggression and so since then i figured out how to change how to like write my wording to be thoughtful and how to like acknowledge people more for the amazing things that they're saying and you know i'm really grateful um for you know black sex workers for stepping up and basically being like very compassionately like hey you fucked up and yeah um, you know completely. and i'm so grateful to them for that you know completely i mean i I'm so, I'm so sort of like, um, I, I hesitate to say the word like proud of us, but maybe like just, I'm really pleased with how we were able to sort of take on that criticism. And I, and I like, I feel like I have a much better sense of self-awareness when it comes mm -hmm. to these things and I can be more intentional about it. Mm -hmm. And it's also like really asked a lot of me in terms of like where I see how I identify myself within all of this mm -hmm. and how much of what I'm doing is sort of ego driven mm -hmm. and like I don't actually think that like altruism or activism has to be completely ego free because if the end product that you do is harm reduction of some kind or like a net positive to the community I don't really mind what people's reasonings are behind what they do mm. but at the very least I can at least like look at what I do now from that perspective and um like I'm like I have at least the language to describe what is happening and right anyway yeah like I learned a lot and yeah <laughs> like feel like maybe you probably feel the same it's like exhausting but I was like oh mm -hmm. okay I see now yeah yeah and I don't know about you but for me it's like and I'm sh and I still have a ton to learn and there's still a ton of work to be done and mm -hmm. you know you know, yes, that was a good outcome, but um, I'm I'm never resigned to like, oh, I've done the work. Like, I'll never be like, oh, I've done the work. I'm doing the work. It's like, yeah, I'm doing the work every single day for the rest of my life. I'm doing the yeah. work, you know? Yeah. 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 For sure. <sighs> I know. <laughs> Sorry to bring it. Oh, my God. We brought that up. Anyway, that is the long version of what we had to do in the past couple months. Yeah, no, I think that that's, it's really good, though, because that was behind the scenes stuff that, that a lot of people weren't privy to. And I think that yeah. that's it's really important, you know, um, to share with everyone. So, yeah. Yeah. And thank you. It was so much fun to work with you and to learn more about you. So it was such an yeah. honor and pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. I remember yeah. immediately after I had decided I'm going to be human trash for the rest of the lockdown period in Toronto. <laughs> and I started watching Drag Race from the very beginning. And I fucking saw you in the second oh, season. Oh, yeah. I was mm -hmm. like, whoa, wait a minute. I know her. You do. It was, it was like, that was me. I was like, oh. <laughs> such a small yeah. world. I know. Like every like at least once a month I get like a screenshot or a picture of someone's TV of me on RuPaul's Drag Race and then they DM it to me and they're like I didn't know you were on RuPaul's Drag Race and my response is lol yeah I was yeah your response is like yeah I was on <laughs> yeah but it's, it's you know it's fine I I love I love Ru, you know, he's an old friend, you know, mm. um, he used to come into Jumbo's clown room and watch all of us dance there. And um, he actually wrote two different songs uh, inspired by dancers at Jumbo's clown room. Mm. And yeah, and so he's best friends with one of my best friends. And so that's how I met him. And he wanted to have pole dancing on his show. So he called me. This was this was when RuPaul's Drag Race was on logo. And yes. he called me directly, which is like, 
not of, yeah. at all what would happen now because it was still really new you know and they yeah, were yeah, yeah, yeah. just beginning to film season two um and I was like yeah of course I'll come and do it and um and we had a blast and yeah he's an old friend um we don't really I mean, talk that much anymore because he's very very busy yes yeah. busy is the word for it <laughs> <laughs> no it's fine I don't think you could have ever foreseen where this would have gone and I'm sure at the time he was just like oh this is like a cool thing to do why not um exactly. but I was I was like oh my god there she is um yeah. I feel like in a lot of ways, like, and don't take this in like a weird ageist way, but in, I t- feel like a lot of ways that you are like one of my stripper moms, because I'm, okay. for, I guess for people who don't know, I'm like 25, I'm like a baby still. Yes. <laughs> and like, I, I, I sort of, I accept the fact that people who are like in their 20s are just morons for the most part, so that's fine. <laughs> like, it's fine. I, mean, I had a hard time in my 20s, so. Yeah, like we're all morons. It's fine, right? And yeah. so, like, I really look up to you. I think Thank what you, you do is amazing, and your sort of your resources are incredible. And Thank like, you. your everything is amazing. So, yeah, Thank I just you. I don't I mind being a pole you. mom. I'm 40, so I'm like totally down to talk about. Actually, it's funny that you mention age and ageism and stripper moms because we're this week with Strippers United. Um, which is we're in the last week of March of 2021 right now. Um, we're honoring veteran strippers. Um, yeah. Yes. So really I love them. They're, they're the best. I mean, this is like a random story. I'll segue into it like just okay. gently. But my favorite stripper currently at, at ever is this woman named Carrie Gold. Mm-hmm. She's English. She stripped in London all throughout like the 80s and 90s and early 2000s. She's this like 50 year old blonde bimbo and she's in the best shape of her life. And she's so funny. And the first time I met her, (laughs) she was driving me to a gig and we were just doing it together. And you know, when you're like getting changed at like, just like a private gig in like a bedroom, normally people just bring some like baby wipes and they just like, you know, wipe where the sun don't shine just to make sure things are clean. She just, she said to me with, I had just met her. She just goes, Oh yeah, like me and my hubby had like a little bit of like a naughty time before I got here. So I just had to make sure that there isn't any like fluid left. And I was like, I just met you. (laughs) She's so funny. And then she's also modeled for the life drawing class that you have come on as well. And whenever she does it in person, she brings her husband with her oh my God. and he's just sat in the corner taking pictures because she's such a content whore. It's really funny. He just sat there taking pictures. I have to explain to the class, you may not take photos. And this man who is bald taking photos of Carrie is Carrie's husband. So please yeah. don't feel uncomfortable. Yes. <laughs> I love it. I love yeah. her so much. And I like, I love her energy and I have way more time for veteran strippers than I do for pretty much any other kind of stripper. So, yeah. Like, I want to look her up. Thank you. I definitely want to look her up. That sounds really fun. She's just so funny. Like imagine what like your your favorite kind of blonde bimbo would be like at 50 and just that's what she's like. She's Pamela really- Anderson. Exactly. She's got yes. so much of that energy. It's so I good. I love Pamela Anderson. She's, she's Canadian as well. It, yes, she is, isn't she? I yeah. love her. The roast of Pamela Anderson is like some of her best work. I just loved the roast. Love um, it. Yeah. So, okay. So you did mention the life drawing classes. So I definitely want to talk about East London Collective and the work that you're doing there. And then I want you to tell us about how that ties into the life drawing classes. Right. Yeah. So East London Strippers Collective was started by a lady called Stacey Clare. And this was like over six years ago. Like when it was like first going, I would have been like 18 years old. So I hadn't even started dancing. Oh, wow. I didn't realize it's been around for that long. Well, so it hasn't really been like incorporated as a company for that long, but as like a, as like a concept. Got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I started getting involved with her by like, she had a Ted talk, which was really, really like fascinating and like, kind of like the, you know, the culmination of the Ted talk was that what we can learn from strippers is this ability to see us for how we would like to be seen and not projecting all these weird things that result in fucked up policy upon us Mm -hmm. instead of asking us what we want to begin with. Um, and so I used to study art. I mean, my bachelor's degree is in fine art. So I love life drawing, like as a 
thing just to do period and I started going to those classes and when I started going to those classes I had also started dancing and then this the class had been running for a couple years at this point and it was Stacy running it and she finds out obviously because I've got a big mouth that I'm a stripper and an artist and she goes do you want to take over the class and I was like yes this is my dream are you kidding me um and so I started running it and like two for like the past two three years I've just been doing it weekly, bi-weekly, we do like the ticket sales and the concept of the life drawing class is very sort of simple. We just hire strippers or ex-strippers and the poses are usually floor work or pole and very, very just sexy and like just whatever strippers do. And it gives us an opportunity to bridge a gap, I think, because there's so much that civilians don't know about what it's really like to be us and they have all these weird preconceptions of what strippers are like and then when they finally meet you it's this this is how we break down stigma it also allows us to put money into the pockets of people who actually need it so the dancers themselves yeah and then I think my my shtick why I think it's really really um I think why it like checks a lot of boxes for people in terms of like a really great event is that it is basically this perfect continuation of art history and artists have always hired sex workers to be their models and their muses yeah why should this be any different this is exactly just that continuation but ethical (laughs) and so yeah that's what I that's what I do now I I just run the life drawing class I research American cyber law in my free time and <laughs> exactly. bask, bask in the sun <laughs> but like East Stripper London Collective you get you all do like you, you do actual work around you know advocacy and activism for strippers and some of the work that you did not too long ago with East Strippers London East London Strippers Collective thank you East London yes. Stripper Collective <laughs> Um, was, you know, you had conversations with FKA Twigs and you, um, yeah. as an organization, you got to do a takeover on her Instagram account. What was that experience like? So I was not like super, super involved with FKA Twigs. I was mostly involved in like the sort of organizing all the copywriting for all the social mm-hmm. media because her mm-hmm. team were just like, we'll give you as many posts as you want you just have to tell us what you want Mm -hmm. so we came up with sort of a intro sort of post for just who we are our life drawing class um some activism and so like some of the law making and the policy and the protesting that has been happening and Mm -hmm. then one that we thought was really important which was uplifting other organizations Mm -hmm. that we thought were really really important Mm -hmm. Um, and this was coinciding with the fact that FK Twigs was coming under fire for um, using like strip aesthetic and pole dancing in her music videos, but like she wasn't out really as a sex worker yet. Now I don't have like realistically a personal opinion on how she does things or whether or not it is valid or whether or not it is harm reductive that's really not up to me to decide right, right. because at the end of the day she did manage to raise um almost 10 grand for ELSC and th- two other organizations and so we are now using that money to give emergency grants to people who have been out of work from COVID specifically like strippers right they're like we're prioritizing people who are like moms who have like dependents um, right whatever and so like she yeah it was okay it was a lot of I think kind of like free therapy on the part of Stacy, who talked to her quite a bit um we also have like members in our collective who because they're based in London and have known her for a while are quite good friends with her and so they mm. know her story we as a collective don't necessarily know because it's not it's not her story to tell and it's yeah. not for us to know either yeah and I think at the end of the day like our the first rule of sex work has always been discretion yeah and so I sit on this like strange line sometimes when it comes to people's sort of public work and their persona of you use the aesthetic and you do pole dancing but because of where your trajectory of your career is you probably can't afford to be out Mm -hmm. but because you're not out as a stripper and you don't sort of claim sex worker as like a identity or as who you are it weirdly gives permission to people who are interested in gentrifying what we do right 
the ability to then use the imagery for themselves and there's like this kind of weird kind of not lack of responsibility but they like shirk their responsibility as a result of like whether or not they can be out or not and like how right. much they claim or whatever and how much they talk about it at all so it was a lot of that kind of conversation going on um a lot of sort of dealing with like trauma around this and like her you know issues around celebrity but yeah yeah at the end of the day the most important part is that we got the money to do that and now we're giving it to people who actually need it so yeah yeah that's yeah, the long and the short. Yeah. Thank you for sharing all of that, by the way, and for lending that perspective. Um, and I'm also really curious about how, like, what was the reaction of her followers of your organization and, and that, you know, different types of information about sex work being on that profile where they're not necessarily accustomed to that? I think for the most part um people were quite positive about it it's also worth noting that fk twigs is like her her fan base already like if you listen to fk twigs there's a fairly good chance you're not horophobic to begin with mm, like okay. her she's got a song called mary magdalene i don't like know how mm. i don't know how much more like obvious really you can get right you know what i mean yeah. um but you there are I mean, there is the like offhand comment of like, this is disgusting, like what you do is disgusting or, right. you know, the standard like troll comments. But I think mm -hmm. we just expected that. Um, and that is, that happens regardless of whether it's on Twigs's account or on our account. Yeah, like, I mean, it just happens. And it probably just happens in general on very, very large accounts. I mean, she's got like a million followers, right? Like literally. Yeah. Yeah. So just statistically speaking exactly. you are going to get <laughs> you are going to get that odd person but the um i think the like uh the reception was like quite good i think people were very um yeah they were very receptive of what that whole the point of that sort of takeover was yeah and um sort of offhandedly this is kind of i mean it's not really classified information but i do know that um should we want to collaborate further i think her team would be more than willing like the door is open we're just sort of blocked by covid right now like there's nothing we can really do outside of online organizing that is meaningful right now and so that everything yeah. is just on pause yeah um yeah i mean fingers crossed i think attitudes are changing in general could they potentially change faster yeah but mm -hmm you know the fact that it is getting slightly more mainstream means that civilians have to reckon with the fact that like their friends and family their moms their sisters their friends are all doing some kind of, someone is doing sex work in their lives right. and it's asking them these questions of like like you know this person you're are you going to like retract your respect for their humanity because you personally think there's something there's an issue with what they do like yeah and I think most rational people would be like well no they're still a human being so I'm right. gonna <laughs> want them to be safe when they do it yeah I asked my mom <laughs> last night I was like mom why do you think that people hate sluts so much like why? you asked your mom that oh god yeah we talk about everything and it's like why do you think like people just get so mad at people who just like like to have a lot of sex or like have sex with a bunch of people like why do you think people talk so much shit about sluts you know mm. and it's a really hard question to answer my mom is okay about it she's interesting she i yeah. know she doesn't love what i do but she does know i mm -hmm. was wearing a sh like a crop top yesterday that said off-duty stripper and i walk into the kitchen she goes <laughs> oh, what's on your t-shirt but then she won't like make it a thing she'll be like oh, i don't like your shirt and then she'll go back to talking about dinner or she'll make a joke like she's really okay about it and i know i can talk to her about things like life drawing like when i talk to her about yeah sometimes life drawing finances she'll go okay honey but make sure that the models get paid first like i know that's you need nice. to get paid but you need to pay the models i'm like yeah okay mom. <laughs> that's nice yeah my mom See, yeah. Like, films me and takes photos of me for i like, love that for you projects and topless things and yeah it's go it's, mom it's very it's very nice yeah it's very nice but um 
Anyways, it's impossible to find an answer. If anyone has the answer, I would love for you to send in comments of why do you think people hate sluts so much? I really, really want you to send in some answers to me, please. I need to understand this. It must be like a mix between cultural conditioning and like, I don't know, like projection and yeah jealousy like it must be a mix of these things like I can't it's just like it's so weird it's like ingrained across like across the board across cultures like yeah everybody has a problem with this and it's yeah really bizarre because it's like it literally has nothing to do with you it's none of your business I don't it's know literally, why <laughs> I don't that's why I'm like so confused about it like it's none of your business what I'm doing with my body why the fuck do you over there care about what I'm doing when you're not around like, I'm not doing it in front of you. I'm not doing it to you. Like, what's your problem? Yeah. I just, I it's very strange. It's very yeah. irrational. I try to, like, <laughs> it, like for all the, like, I'm sure you get this, for all the existential crises I go through because of my issues with, like, intellectual capacity of humanity at large, I think the one thing that, like, helps carry me through this is to make sure that I always remind myself that we're just all a bunch of overgrown monkeys. <laughs> And some of us like to show monkeys our butts, like presenting. Right. And some monkeys like to give us bananas or like <laughs> rare rocks. And some monkeys do like mating dances. And that's it. That's all. Right. Sometimes they fight. Sometimes we don't. Yeah. We're just like overgrown monkeys, whatever. And We're, that helps. Yeah. We're so much like animals and there's so much like us. It's unbelievable. Like uh, I'll, uh, all right, I'm going to tell you this one quick story. There's mm. um, a certain type of dolphin and I, I can't remember what type of dolphin they are, <laughs> um, but they literally dive, the male dolphins dive to the bottom of the ocean floor and look for the shiniest rock. And then they put it in, in between their snout thingy, you know? Yeah. And they, and then they, so they hold it in their snout thingy and they, rise up out of the water very slowly and present the rock to hopeful female you know mates <laughs> and i'm like oh my god that's like men buying engagement rings like or people buying engagement rings for other people or like people buying jewelry for each other and like exactly. see don't you want to date me i bought you this like really nice <laughs> diamond and the dolphin's like look at this shiny rock that i found and like whoever finds the biggest shiniest rock like they're more likely to get the mate that they want because they're literally exactly and so like for all the like intellectualizing i do (laughs) over humanity when i just like remind myself that we are basically just overgrown versions of that i feel (laughs) much better about how we behave and i'm not so worried anymore (laughs) yeah yeah it's the only thing tethering me to sanity currently (laughs) yeah um, so I do want to talk about something a little bit more serious. Right. Um, okay. Yeah. Usually, you know, when I prep for these, I, um, I stalk people's Instagram accounts. So I did that for you this morning. Um, and I found a post that you wrote and I'm, I'm going to read part of it to you so that mm-hmm. the audience can get the context. Um, You wrote, does my performative aesthetic of sexy Asian perpetuate dangerous stereotypes or does my ownership and control over it trump the inevitable objectification? I really don't have answers. I just hope that the work I do now and in the future will do more good than harm. Can you just elaborate on like what was happening for you there when you wrote this? So, um... I'm not sure when this episode is getting released, but at the time of recording, it has been about a week and a half since the shootings in Atlanta, in which mm-hmm. eight people died in massage parlors, mm-hmm. over three different massage parlors, six of mm-hmm. whom were Asian women. Mm-hmm. Um, I like to like, I also want to like clarify that like for all the stuff that I talk about in terms of how this is a racially, you know, um, motivated attack I think also the conversation of sex workers has to be in that conversation as well Mm -hmm. not because those women were sex workers it is the assumption that they were Mm -hmm. and that Mm -hmm. because the assumption is that anyone who is an immigrant who works at a massage parlor who looks like me must be a sex worker that in and of itself is like racist and Mm -hmm. um 
forces us to ask lots of questions about how we fetishize Asian women. Mm -hmm. So I have spent the better part of three years performing cabaret stripping and I, whether, whether I wanted to or not, a lot of the Asian aesthetic has been kind of projected onto me. Mm -hmm. Not something I'm used to because again, I grew up in Toronto and where I grew up is like a very sort of heavily Asian um, community. So Mm -hmm. I never really felt that being Asian was like a thing. I just was like, I just grew up with it. It just was normal to me Mm because everyone I grew up with kind of looked like me. And like, I also grew up around like, again, Toronto is very multicultural. So like none of this really occurred to me, like none of my like more sophisticated thinking about race and sex and how the intersections overlap ever happened until I moved to London. Mm. Because in London, I am some people's like only Asian friend. And Mm. so they really sort of make me feel more Asian than I I feel like I am. Mm -hmm. And so this manifests in the form of lots of gigs and lots of sort of commission-based performance work where people ask me to be like a geisha Mm. or do something in a cheap how or in cosplay, whatever Mm. that is, right? Mm -hmm. First of all, I'm not Japanese. I should not be dressing up as a geisha. Mm -hmm. But I just don't think necessarily some white people understand the difference to begin with. Mm -hmm. And so when they book these gigs, they're thinking their image of like a fetishized version of Asian women. And to them, the first thing that pops up is geisha. And so Mm -hmm. I have spent a lot of time thinking about whether or not me saying yes to these gigs is, you know, good or bad and I use quotation marks because obviously the answer is not that black and white Mm -hmm. and part of the argument is if I don't do it they will just hire somebody else Mm -hmm. who may Mm -hmm. not do it with my level of control or like my level of sort of creative um, agency Mm -hmm. they might hire someone white to do this which is so much worse to to watch like just like a nice brunette English girl from Manchester put like space buns in their hair and chopsticks. That is so much worse than if I do it. (laughs) Like that's way worse. So kind of like lesser of two evils kind of thing going on. And then the other issue here is that like, if I'm getting paid, I kind of consent to somebody looking at me like that Mm -hmm. and perceiving me that way. And I think the like through me talking about this and me sort of thinking about it in the past week and a half, I've sort of come to a conclusion where like I don't get to exist in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. And so while I respect there's a lot of particularly other Asian women like who are a little bit older than me, like sort of millennials, mid 30s, early 40s, who would prefer if we just stopped perpetuating the stereotype and stopped using the aesthetic altogether. I think they forget that we don't live in a vacuum. I don't get to just exist outside of this paradigm. I have to work with it. This is what pays my bills. This is what got me my job in the first place. I got hired at my first nightclub as like a circus performer because the creative director wanted to do geisha ads. I wouldn't have the job I have now if it weren't for that. And um, so the best I can do now is sort of when I get given these briefs, I demand a certain level of creative freedom Mm -hmm. so that when I present it to people, it's not this like heavily stereotyped, very tacky sort of 1970s like Ling Ling type of performance Mm -hmm. it's got some layers to it in some way that is specifically for the people in Asian community and it's like these little easter eggs where it's like they see it and I'm like that I did that for you I read Mm -hmm. the I write things in this language on my body for you it's not for anybody else no one else is going to get it I perform to let's say Japanese like metal or like K-pop for you, not for anybody else. Right. Um, And then the final sort of, I guess, most important thing here is that blaming me for using the aesthetic that has been forced upon me for the objectification and fetishization of Asian women at large is like another form of victim blaming. Mm -hmm. 
I don't think actually it's my responsibility to police how other people see me and Asian women at large. I think it's the responsibility of other people to stop fetishizing us. I mean, yeah, thank you for saying that because I'm over here sitting like when you first said the thing about how some people wish that, you know, Asian women such as yourself, you know, they just wish you would stop promoting or perpetuating that stigma. It's like, oh, but I think that means people need to be educated though and you know because I don't look at you and think the things that you know a, a young white man would think because I'm educated and there are other men and white men out there that are educated about how to treat you with respect and it's also you know. this like conversation I think about consent mm -hmm. and I think it extends further than racial stereotypes. This also is a very feminist idea of I, I some as women part of my love language whether queer or otherwise is sometimes being an object of desire mm -hmm. but on my own terms. Right. And I give you in a performance or on stage or in a strip club or in sex work, I give you that space to see me that way. And it's, it's like consensual. Right. I'm allowing you to project those fantasies on me for a certain amount of money, for a certain amount of time in a certain context. That is okay. Right. What is not okay is when this extends to like real life and you take it out of that context and that person that you are objectifying has not actually given you their consent. And this mm. is what then results in real life violence. Right. So like that is also like part of the conversation because like I think about in my own personal life or like in sex work, the like me using Asian aesthetic or like putting my makeup on in a certain way to look a certain way this is me giving somebody the consent to do that under certain terms, right? right? I am really not okay with it when I'm like at a fucking bus stop with my hair in a bun, my baby hairs are literally making a halo around me and I'm wearing sweatpants. Please don't, please don't yell ni hao at me on the streets or like worse. <laughs> like, so sorry. Yeah. Oh, it's fine. It, this happens just like all the time. This is like my, this is just like my daily life. Right. And I hate that I got used to it, but here we are. Yeah. So there's like a big difference between that and me doing a performance to Japanese metal and doing a circus contortion act in a fetish club. Those right. are two very separate <laughs> events. Yeah. But it's, it, they have a lot of overlap because I can't stop somebody looking at that image of me and thinking this reinforces their stereotypes but that's not my problem I shouldn't have to like every single waking moment of my life kind of justify my existence to somebody right when really I think it should be can't we just teach people why don't you just see people how they want to be seen what's wrong with you yeah or like you said like context time yes. and place where exactly. are you this is you are a human being at a bus stop you're not looking for objectification because I don't think objectification is necessarily a bad thing in and of itself, mm -hmm. but in different contexts, it can be harmful and dangerous. But yeah, it's all about, it's kind of like, you know, the way I treat Facebook versus Instagram. I don't know if this is like a totally off base example, but like on Facebook, I'm like, oh, my family is there. Yeah. So I treat that like a family party and on Instagram, my fans and my friends are here. So like if I go to my grandma's birthday party, I'm not going to act a certain way than if I go to like, you know, uh, a drug booze party with my friends, you exactly. know, I'm going to act, I'm going to act different. And then I'm going to, I'll be, I'll expect to be treated differently in each of those scenarios and, um, and not harmfully in either one, but like, I'm not going to flash everybody at the party at my grandma's party. Yeah. You know, and just like exactly. you at the bus stop, like you're not, you're just being a person. Why are you being yelled at, objectified, like put in a situation where you feel like someone might harm you for you not like doing what it is they expect you or want you to do, you know, it's. it's like, yeah. I, almost, I almost cried just now. I had to like fight back tears when you told me like, some of the things that people just say to you in passing. Oh no, it's yeah, it's, it's hard. It hurts. It it's hurts. okay. It, I mean, it's not okay, but it right. is. 
it is like it's a reality for me yeah. and for like basically anyone who looks like me um yeah and I mean I'm just reckoning with it like mm. I one of the things I also do that is um I think really important in like the healing process for this is I work with a queer Asian cabaret collective in London called the Bitten Peach and like it's basically everything that I do encapsulated into like a Gaijin space mm. where like everybody there everybody's acts is kind of playing on these different ideas of Asian stereotypes and we also include Southeast Asian and South Asian within the East Asian narrative like everything it's all there because right. we're all like yeah we all eat rice and beat our kids like that's we all have that in common so <laughs> we decided well let's have like a yeah let's have like a collective based off of that yeah. and so these like really beautiful like Bollywood like imagery and Bollywood dancing and like the costuming and then one of my like drag queen friends is doing does like very interesting sort of like a play on like a Thai accent and like why people go to Thailand to see like things like ping pong shows or like myself doing kind of like very 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 sensual erotic but very like also yeah Asian kind of inspired mm -hmm. themed shows yeah is a way for us to play with these ideas and pick them apart and I think reclaim them yeah because it doesn't feel as people who are diasporic because like the very few of us were born in Asia we were mm -hmm. like westernized we were like sort of ripped away from these like stories and yeah. told that like they're not ours and then to have them presented back to us by like our colonizers and told that like <laughs> yeah and like told that this is like a oh this is like a story that is this and this and it like it it, the context that they have it all in is all wrong so for us to be able to reclaim that in like a performative way I think is really important yeah and I yeah I, I also don't think other Asians have to like what we do not everyone has to that's okay right then, again we're not a monolith I can't speak for everybody I just speak for like myself and some people who do what I do and like who know me that I think what I do is a fairly healthy reflection of who I am yeah. and I'm playing with these ideas and I'm trying my best to still also speak up for my community and like other concurrent communities around me and do my best and that's as good as it can get for right <laughs> <Yeah>. now <laughs> wow. sorry I was really long no 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 please don't apologize and I think you're doing amazing and thank you so much for you know talking about a, a sensitive topic like that one so I really appreciate that and I, I think it's really important for our audience to understand your your point of view as um you know as you represent the Asian community and Asian sex worker community it's mm -hmm. it's really important so thank you so much want to be fabulous just like these strippers pay attention it's stripper tips one of the ones when I was first starting out, so I guess this is for like baby strippers, one of the first ones I ever had when I was starting out was when you go to auditions, get a fake tan. <laughs> I, I can't, I honestly, like it made me feel so much better. And like, there's something about having like some color that stops things like redness showing up, any blemishes cellulite there's nothing wrong with these things but club owners sometimes think there's something wrong with these things so if you want to get hired you gotta hide these things a fake tan was like amazing and I was like oh my god like I feel like I feel like a stripper now I feel great <laughs> <laughs> so like yeah get a get a fake tan before you go to audition and I think maybe the other one is if you can target couples I used to love seeing a couple especially heterosexual couples come into the strip club because the guy in that situation doesn't really mind what he's getting he's right. not making the decisions you have to hustle the girls yeah and I'm as gay as they come so I was like I would just make a beeline for them I'd be like hi what are you doing here what's your name and then you like become friends with the girl and she'll be like okay babe like do you want a lap dance and the funniest thing is always the guys are like I just want you to dance on her I want her to feel good yeah. and then you end up doing this lap dance for like this straight girl who's just like wow like your skin's really soft and then you have this conversation <laughs> about skincare with her and like the guy is sat across from you licking his lips going oh she's so sexy and I'm like you have no idea yeah <laughs> <What's going on? laughs> yeah I so, yeah. <laughs> love dancing for women there yes, it was so my good. absolute favorite yes yes 
dance, especially, yeah, it was no matter what, it didn't matter. Like uh, dancing for a woman was so much fun and so much, so much better. <laughs> so much better. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if you are in the middle of a hustle and you're hustling like two people and they happen to be a couple, hustle the woman. But like the hustle doesn't have to be, I think people can, this is the other, like the final tip I think is like, I think people for, some people don't really know what hustle looks like or sounds like and I have like a real problem with hustle that sounds like you're like entitled to their money or like kind of like forcing it upon them mm -hmm. I think that's like incredibly untactful and like not that strategic and not very graceful so like I usually try giving people I guess this is like not really a stripper tip this is more of like a sugar baby tip but like mm -hmm. when people always ask me how do you get somebody to pay you for just meeting them for dinner right for a date and I'm like don't just go sit there and beg or tell them like oh you can't afford your rent or like my time is worth this like don't pull, you can't pull that with somebody in the beginning I'm like you have to make them feel like they want to give it to you mm -hmm. so the, like the thing I always pull like the bullshit I always feed people is things like listen like I've been burned before and I really, really, really just need to trust you. And like, I'm in this for the long run. I really would hope that you would be too. And I have a lot of respect for you. And I hope that you also respect me. And so for like a little while, it's going to have to be pay per meet until we can sort of build rapport and build trust. And I really want this to work out. And I think yeah. that is hustle. That <laughs> yeah. is what it sounds like. I can't yeah. stand like the like really quick, fast paced, like, do you want a lap dance if you don't want a lap dance what are you doing here like i'm like stop yeah. it you're ruining it for the rest of us please <laughs> that's my last little tip i love it have i love it better it's very better hustle. Good. yeah thank you see that would it. work right that would yeah, work on the right person. absolutely yeah i love it i want to go back to the club and hustle again damn it i know when i miss it that so happen? much i know i miss it too get ready for our rapid fire question round it's time for four for one Question number one, what would a world populated by clones of you be like? Super, super high functional, incredibly efficient, and very high tech. I think about this all the time. I was I thinking it. about this the other day about you how I would, love, I would love some clones of myself. I have too many things to do all the time. <laughs> I, I would love, love that you knew exactly how to answer that question because when I was putting it down, I was like, this is a really hard question. Okay. <laughs> What are some red flags to watch out for in daily life? Uh, are you talking about like relationships or just in, in general? Red flags? Um, being foggy minded and like tired, I think, and confused is like a really, really strong sign that you should probably stop drinking five coffees a day and sleep and rest. Mm. That's a really, really, really bad sign, I think. So like that kind of like exhaustion. And then... Mm. I actually think if you're the kind of person who has a fairly strong friend group and family group, when they start bringing up things to you, that can be a pretty good sign that you're not maybe necessarily on the right path. People who mm -hmm. love you will not let you stray so fucking far, mm -hmm. usually. Nice. Um, and my last thing is if you're smoking weed fucking every single fucking day or you're like some kind of like dependent on a substance, that is probably a pretty mm. good red flag. Okay. I know a lot of people who smoke weed all day, every day. I am I smoke weed every day. Oh my God, do you? Yes. How do you function? Well, I smoke it at night mostly. Um, and when I was dealing with my pain from my accident, I was smoking it every day because I That's was fair. in pain. And then I just kind of stopped smoking it in the middle of the day because it's kind of a lot of extra work. Um, I just get so tired. Yeah, I, but I, not everybody does though. I know a lot of people who are like highly productive and functional on it. I cannot for the, I'm like, good for them. I wish yeah. that was me, but I just turn into human trash for the rest of the day. I, I mean, can't. everyone's affected differently by it. Okay, you have two more questions. Cool. How would your country change if everyone, regardless of age, could vote? If everyone, regardless of age, could vote? Um, are you talking about the UK or Canada? I'll go with Canada since I'm in Canada right now. Um, I think we would be a lot more like liberal leaning. I think that for sure. And we would specifically, I'm thinking right now in Ontario, there's like this whole thing where like our 
our like MP for our province is trying to like build over like protected wetlands because he's his pockets have been lined by like developers who specifically want access to that wetland and they're doing it and they're trying to push it through right now because right now is when the ducks start coming in to mm. mate on that wetland <laughs> and the second i'm serious and the second it starts to happen they can't build on it anymore because like you can't build over top of wetlands where ducks are mating and i think it's like literally like comically evil what they're trying to do and if teenagers were allowed to vote, I or just five-year-olds, if you told five-year-olds, this old fat like man who's like the brother of like crackhead Rob Ford is trying to destroy wetlands and kill baby ducks, they would all be like, no, no, don't kill the baby ducks. Okay. Wow. That's my answer. I love it. <laughs> Last one. What would you want to have buried with you so you could use it in the afterlife? I, I, my first thought was glitter. Hey, then that's it. <laughs> <laughs> I never, I don't want to be buried though. I wanted to be cremated. So it's weird because I envisioned my mom doing this and I hope I don't die before her because that's really heartbreaking for her. But she was yeah. like, whoever, whatever happens to you, you will probably have to be like, your ashes will have to be mixed in with glitter. And I'll be like, well, yeah. Perfect. Well, yeah, then the, that's what your answer is. Cremated my answer glitter. Is glitter. I love it. Glitter. <laughs> cremated remains and on that note (laughs) um okay so before we get to all of the things that the ways that people can follow you i just want to remind everybody one more time as i mentioned earlier that here on yes or stripper podcast we are now accepting donations because i want to keep this podcast as commercial free as possible so if you'd like to donate to yes a stripper podcast you can send that in to paypal.me forward slash yes a stripper podcast and a reminder that almost the majority of the money is supposed to go to our guests because the majority of our guests are out of work sex workers and strippers so again that's paypal.me forward slash yes a stripper podcast Thank you for listening to that PSA. Sam, tell everyone, please, where they can find you. So you can find me on Instagram. Um, My handle is samantha.ssun. So two S's, fun. Um, You can follow like my life drawing stuff at Life Drawing with EOSC and East London Strippers Collective is Ethical Stripper. Um, yeah, we have a website. You can go there as well. You can never find everything on the Instagram. Um, and that's kind of it. All my links are there as well. Awesome. Thank you. So be sure to follow Samantha on all the things. And thank you so much, Sam, for being here. It was just so much fun chatting with you. I think this thank is the you. most time we've spent together without working. So yeah. 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 I feel like I could like go off on a lot of tangents with you and I apologize I if we did that too much. No, <laughs> you were great and it was so much fun. Thank you so much for being here and thank you so much to our audience as always for tuning in. I love hearing from you. So please always send DMs or emails. Yes, the stripper podcast. See everyone next week. Thanks for tuning in. Bye. Bye. We're on Instagram at period podcast network. Be sure to follow us on Instagram too at Yes A Stripper Podcast, and you can find us on Twitter at Yes A Stripper Pod. Please like, subscribe, and rate Yes A Stripper Podcast here on YouTube. See-